All right there, Johnny McGonigal. How are you? It is it is still early May. Talking a little Penn State football here on the Blue White Breakdown podcast. But, you know, Johnny, I told you I was going to try and change it up a little. I'm not going to go right to the Penn State football. I want to know. I want to know about the wedding and oh, specifically about you at a wedding reception. Having been around you a little bit for the last couple of years, I think that is something that could get real interesting real quick. Yeah, me, me. You can just give us the the PG stuff. Yeah, no, it was a great time. Uh, so yeah, it was a wedding between two of my best friends. Uh, the the girl is actually a Penn Stater, so uh, and and is very interested in our work uh, covering Uh-oh. Penn State football. Um, the, the guy went to Delaware, but a, a really good friend, uh, from Delco from, from childhood and, and high school and everything. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a great time. It was in Philly at the, uh, crystal tea room over the weekend. If any of the Ooh. listeners are familiar, uh, really cool venue, uh, was in the wedding party. Um, oh, so yeah. it was a long weekend, uh, a Friday wedding, Bob, which I, you know, is becoming more and more popular now. I yes, feel like, is. Um, yep. And, uh, and you kind of just carry over the party a little bit through the weekend on Saturday and even a little bit on Sunday. Uh, the, the Broad Street run was in Philly on Sunday. I did not participate, but I did meet up with friends afterwards uh, at the bar who ran. Uh, so that's my that's my form of participation there. Uh, a, yeah, a really good weekend. And uh, and yeah, as you can imagine, I love a wedding reception. Uh Love, love breaking it down. Had to switch out of the, uh, you know, the stiff dress shoes, though, and put on a pair of Nikes for the uh, for the dance floor. Uh, so we're talking tuxedo, the whole nine yards. And then yeah. finally, just for because I think the Penn State fans want to know what what bar were you at on Sunday in Philly? And is it a good bar? Because I'm going to Philly, I think, in like a week. So I might need to go there. What is it? Yeah, we were at Ten Stone, which is in a uh, grad hospital, uh, South Philly area. And right. uh, it, it's a bar that you would like. It's very just neighborhood. You kind of. Mm-hmm. Not quite divey divey, but I mean they got a dartboard. Um, okay. They've they've got a pool table. Uh, I think it'd kind of be right up your alley, Bob. It's All right, one, one of uh, one of my personal favorites in the city. I always try and get some uh, drinking information out of you when I know you've had a a fun weekend. So that has been noted, just like Mario's in Pittsburgh has been noted. Yes. So we can now officially, now that we're like three minutes into this thing, talk about Penn State football, Johnny. Let's just talk about. You know, the, the transfer portal and Penn State there at the end, <clears throat> probably maybe a little bit more activity, I think, than most Penn State fans uh, were expecting. There, uh, a couple people went in very late. Um, you know, we've, you, you've written about it. I've written about it. I mean, the name, <clears throat> really, when you look at all of the losses in the transfer portal, I mean, I really think that of all of the losses, King Mack is the one that interests me the most, even more than Keandre Lambert-Smith, the second-year safety Florida kid, coveted kid, top 100 kid, wasn't going to start this year unless there were some injuries. Um, just you read on the situation, and then I have, I have a follow-up for you just about something James Franklin said, you know, right after the blue-white game that really kind of set the stage for this, I think, in my mind. Yeah, Bob, we were expecting throughout the spring transfer portal window that an exodus of some uh, of some magnitude would come uh, to this roster given the scholarship you know, situation. Uh, and, and, you know, they left it late uh, because I, I know that some people got confused by this and it, it is, you know, understandably confusing a bit, the portal. Yeah. Uh, you know, it closed last Tuesday, uh, you know, to undergrads. It closed last Wednesday uh, to grad transfers. But there's a that's just for the players to basically inform their schools that they are intending to enter the portal. And then those compliance offices have like 48 hours to process the information. And so uh, we saw a late flurry in the dying embers of the of the spring window uh, on Thursday and, and Friday of a handful of Penn State players entering the portal. You mentioned King Mac uh, being probably the headliner of that group uh, in particular. Mm-hmm. Uh, London Montgomery as well, the running back from Scranton Prep. Uh, Carmelo Taylor, uh, Malik McLean, a couple of wide receivers, Golden Israel Achumba, a reserve offensive lineman. Uh, among those who, you know, from a Penn State perspective, uh, helps out from a scholarship standpoint, but, uh, and, and a few of those Penn State is comfortable, you know, losing, um, you know, players who weren't going to have a role in 2024. But King Mack is the one that stings out of the group. Um, I think we both agree, you know, he wasn't yeah. going to start 
you know, this upcoming season as a sophomore, uh, you know, KJ Winston, Jalen Reed, Zaki Wheatley, uh, the team's top three safeties at the moment uh, for a defense that will be featuring three safety looks. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I thought King Mack would have been that fourth option uh, and played a lot of games. I mean, he played in every game uh, for this team last year, burned his red shirt as a true freshman, uh, consensus four-star, top 150 prospect uh, that they were able to get out of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, a powerhouse high school program in Florida. Uh, and uh, they had to fend off SEC interest to get him to stay college yeah. in the first place. And so, uh, yeah, a difficult loss there for Penn State, but not, not one they necessarily wanted to lose uh, to the portal. Yeah, and I, I do think you mentioned Carmelo Taylor. I – I saw there was, I think, a report on uh, uh, Blue White Illustrated. Sean Fitz said it might not necessarily be a portal situation. It might have been another issue. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. It, but I, I don't know that he actually was a, a portal casualty, or it might have been something else with him. But anyway, uh, second year wideout. I think he practiced in the spring, but the uh, the makeover of the wideout room is is just ongoing. But getting back to King Mac, you know, um, I, I two things. Uh, struck me about him this year we didn't really hear when they when, when whether it was Tom Allen or or your the position coaches or James Franklin we didn't really hear much about you know that usually they tell you without telling you right if you don't hear somebody's name as somebody who's drawing buzz he he did not really pop in terms of you know guys uh you know the it was always the key Wheatley right it was the key Wheatley was the third safety you know, and then Snickle look. I, that when I when James, I think Tom Allen said that Harris could actually be the nickel because he's a bigger corner. I was thinking that's going to force, you know, that that's another player that's going to probably prevent King Mac maybe from seeing even, you know, you know, you know, second team snaps if yeah. it's if it's a nickel. So and then he's a kid that's always used to playing. I just you, you just wonder, you know, you don't know, know what all went into the decision. But, you know, if you just fast forward to 2025, I mean, t odds are very good that they're going to replace both starting safeties. Um, you don't know. I mean, as a key Wheatley, you know, could be back. You don't even know about him if he has a big year. But but the runway was there for King Mac, I think, to play, you know, a, a couple years at Penn State. So he must he must have had a pretty good deal. I, he, he must have a pretty good offer. But he was definitely a promising player. I just wonder the fact that we never really heard his name, if maybe the depth chart was a little bit different than we thought it was. Yeah, that's that's fair. That that you know, that's a good point, Bob, in terms of uh, you know, his name circulating in the spring among the coaching staff and the teammates. I know that I think Jalen Reed had some really nice things to say about him at one point, yeah. saying that, you know, when he gets on the field, he'll he'll show the world what he can do, kind of deal. Um, but and just another thing to note too, because obviously, you know, technically, you know, teams cannot, you know, talk to players until yeah. they're in the portal. And then whenever a player ends up at a school, they're like, yeah, I didn't talk to this coach until I answered my name in the portal. That, that doesn't happen. I mean, yeah. the, 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 the tampering aspect of this is rampant throughout college football. Uh, a lot of times players enter the portal already knowing where they're going, having talked to, you know, schools. And I mean, I, I remember last summer when we talked to, Jaywan Sider, he was saying that schools were trying to to you know pit Katron Allen and Nick yeah. uh, Singleton against each other and to you know get one of those guys to enter the portal and, and bail on Penn State, uh, which they you know ultimately did not do. But you know this, that could be a situation where King Mac was getting uh, getting some DMs, getting some texts or some phone calls, and uh, saying, "Hey, we're really interested in you, and uh, you know here's what you could potentially make in an NIL situation at at insert school here." Uh, so just something to keep in mind uh, yeah. as with, as with just the portal in general, that's kind of how it works uh, until the NCAA gets a better grasp on how they want to handle this thing uh, and, and, you know, litigate it. But uh, yeah, from a player standpoint with King Mac, he was, like you said, he had that runway to 2025 as a starter because, you know, KJ Winston could very easily go in the 2025 NFL draft. And, uh, and even if, it, if, even if they just lost him and still, you know, had Reed and, and Wheatley, if Tom mm -hmm. Allen is still the DC on this team, and you know for 2025, that four-two-five look, that three-safety potential look, um, you're looking at playing time if you're King Mac. And so, uh, yeah, it's 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 a player that they did not want to lose. Um, but it's not like he's a he's a bang-on starter like right now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if if that's the one that ultimately stings, you know, him and I think Keandre Lambert Smith, despite the inconsistencies that we've talked about over the last few months. 
Uh, if those are the two really that you lose in the portal, yeah, um, I think you can. I think you can live with it. Um, and uh, and knowing too that they needed they needed to lose guys to right. to get closer, uh, inch closer to that eighty five scholarship limit. Yeah, that's the other thing I wanted to get to because uh, it was pretty clear they were. I don't know if it, what the the number was, but it was close to maybe ten players or ten scholarships uh, heavy, and there there were at some point. Something was gonna something was gonna happen, yeah. right? And I just I just hearken back to James has always said at the end of spring, like they meet with the position coaches, and then I meet with every player on the roster for thirty minutes, and that's that's a lot of that's a lot of meetings, and it takes you know it takes a while to get to everyone. So when people kind of I always wonder when people go into the transfer portal this late, I, you wonder how long ago those conversations with James took place, what was said in those room, what was said in those meetings. Cause James says, you know, a lot of them are, he's, he's blunt with, with, with some of the players, you know, yeah. whether they're going to play at all, you know, whether, you know, whether they have a chance to play in the future. And, um, you know, I just, I just think that maybe there was some, probably some meetings where some players kind of were not so gently nudged in maybe in the direction of maybe what's best for you might not be at Penn state. It's up to you, but, um, I, I'm always fascinated. I would love to hear some of those conversations. I wouldn't, I would even agree not to, just to listen in, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. See how, sure. see how direct he can be because they, they go on in, in these meetings in, in, at every major program and it can't be easy to hear some of this stuff. But I think, I think if a player's realistic, if he's an older player, I mean, he knows it's coming, but it's the younger players. I think sometimes Sometimes that's kind of, that can be a little bit jarring. I don't know what that meeting was like for King Mac with James Franklin, but he was going to have to pair the roster. Uh, they've done quite a bit of it. I think they're a lot closer maybe to the number they need to get, and I'm sure there'll be some more movement. Some players are going to come on board, I think, you know, the rest of the freshman class. But uh, the, 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 the scholarship reduction is underway at Penn State, and other than King Mac, I mean, I, I to me – Key Andre Lambert Smith, I think, I think we had seen the best of him at Penn State for whatever reason. So I, I just think King Mac was an interesting player. Be interested to see what they've done, but they haven't traditionally lost a lot of guys to the portal that have really flourished. And I think they I, they should be commended for being able to protect their core and also to add in the transfer portal. It's it's definitely not been something that's hurt Penn State, and I think James and his coaches should be commended for that. Yeah, definitely, Bob. And just one more note to add to you. You talked about the conversation aspect of this, the, uh, you know, James and his assistant coaches sitting down, you know, with the players and, and having and James always has those tough, honest conversations with the players. And you have to wonder, too, though, how much the tenor of those conversations, the, the topic of those conversations change as the portal plays out. And, yeah. and, if, if, and if you're James Franklin and you're the staff and you're trying to manage the roster and see what you will and won't have to at a certain extent, it's a guessing game until really the very end of the portal when you have a better idea of, Hey, are we going to bring anyone in? Okay. We didn't bring anyone in in the portal. Here's yeah. what we have to lose. Okay. Which players are going to leave? And then that, that there's a trickle down effect, right? Because yeah. look, if, you know, theoretically, uh, hypothetically, if Cam Wallace had entered the portal, the running back, the fellow, you know, him and London Montgomery came into the, you know, Penn State in the 2023 recruiting class. Neither played last year, but, you know, it was pretty clear, I think, from talking to coaches and players yeah. and everything, that Cam Wallace was ahead of London Montgomery uh, in that battle for the number three running back spot behind Singleton and Catron. And so if Cam Wallace, who's a Georgia native and I'm sure an SEC school would have loved to have him. If he entered the portal, then I think the conversation with Lana Montgomery changes. Yeah. Uh, and so the fact that Cam Wallace stays and Lana Montgomery goes, um, you know, it's a tough deal for London, who uh, was a standout at Scranton Prep as a junior, you know, a four star prospect, has a serious knee injury, misses yeah. his senior season, and he comes in at, I believe, 185. And, and you know, this spring he weighed in at 186 pounds. And, yeah. and James Franklin was very honest about that playing weight not being basically good enough yeah you can't uh, play you can't play in the big 10 at that weight you just can't no you, you can't pass block you can't you can't take the hits um and and so this season 
he probably wasn't going to have a role. And so, you know, if Cam Wallace had left, then the conversation with Lennon Montgomery probably would have gone a little bit differently. And that's just speculating a bit, but that, yeah. that's, that's what I'm saying as an example, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so London Montgomery's gone. And so the running back situation, it's, it's Nick Singleton and Catron Allen are your bell cows. And then you've got now Cam Wallace, uh, the, the early enrollee freshman from Bell Vernon, Quentin Martin, yeah. who I think can be utilized as a yeah. receiving back more than anything, uh, at least early in his career. Uh, those two guys uh, seemingly, you know, will be competing for that number three spot. You have Corey Smith, the four star uh, from Wisconsin enrolling, I believe, this month as well. So, um, you know, they needed to lose some bodies at certain positions. I think running back was one of them. Wide receiver, they had a glut of, uh, you know, really guys who hadn't proved anything yet. Um, and and they could have shed some weight there and they did. Uh, you know, whether it was Carmelo Taylor and yeah. you know, Malik McLean, who had the nice opener against West Virginia, didn't do much outside of that. Uh, Malik, Mc, uh, Malik Mega left earlier in the window. So, uh, yeah, they, they needed to, to do a little spring cleaning, uh, and, and they did that. Yep. All right. We are we're moving along on this blue-white breakdown. We're almost two-thirds of the way home, Johnny. Uh, and I promise I won't talk about your personal life anymore until the next podcast. But yeah, yeah, until um, the next opening of the next. Until the next, I always, but I will pounce when I have an opportunity, Johnny. The what we're going to talk about it probably as we get closer to August. But I still think we could we could talk about it now. Coming out of spring, it's been what almost three weeks, a little more than three weeks. What are the positions, or what are the battle? What's unsettled in your mind at Penn State? What are what are the what are the key, maybe? competitions that are probably going to be looming, assuming everyone's healthy, you know, going into August, what, what are the positions that have your eye and who are the players you think that are in the running to either, you know, either start or be, you know, in the case of like offensive tackle, swing tackle is a big deal or third corner, you know, we we know, we pretty much know what the safety thing is going to look like. I think linebacker, pretty much know who the, the, the two best ones are, but what what's unsettled in your mind and who are the players and positions, you know, you're going to kind of Penn state fans should kind of be watching uh, as they came out of spring, but also to get ready for August. Yeah. I mean, look, the, the wide receiver room, I think is the easiest answer in the world. And I, I, I dove into, a, you know, yeah. room a little bit more this week and just t- kind of, you know, hitting the reset button, taking stock, uh, after Keandre leaves, after you know Mega McLean, Carmelo Taylor no longer with the team, uh, and kind of what options they they have now. It's Julian Fleming, Harrison Wallace, uh, you know who I think can be an All Big Ten type of player if he can just stay healthy. That's and the, it's a huge if. Uh, and then you've got what Caden Saunders, Amari Evans, you know two guys from the 2022 recruiting class who you know Caden was a top 100 prospect. Amari Evans has the speed to burn, but. Uh, have combined for 17 catches in, in you know in two seasons now at Penn State. Mm-hmm. And they're going to be more out of those two. Liam Clifford, a sneaky option out of the slot. I mean, you know, so the the wide receiver room is you know, has been under scrutiny really for the last two years, and uh, that's not going to change you know in the next four months uh, up until the opener uh, in 2024. But uh, you know, the one one position you mentioned there was corner, and, and I'm very intrigued to see how that plays out because you lose Kalen King, Johnny Dixon, Daquan Hardy uh, from the, from that room and, and, you know, three veterans, three guys who, uh, yeah, the, the, the performance might've been up and up and down a little bit last year, but three mm-hmm. guys who you could reasonably rely on. Uh, and now you've got Cam Miller, who I think has taken more of a leadership role in that room. They added AJ Harris from Georgia. Yeah. Uh, we heard really good things from during the spring. Mm-hmm. Jalen Kimber started 11 games of Florida last year. Well, Davian Collins is a is a name that uh, you know Terry Smith said has was the most improved in the corner room. Was playing the most consistent out of anyone in the corner room. Uh, and uh, you know we're we're recording this on uh, Tuesday afternoon. I've got a story coming out on uh, Davian yeah. on on Wednesday morning. And you know he transferred in from Mississippi State uh, last spring and didn't play as a freshman uh, for the Bulldogs and. You know, only played in six games last year, but he kind of knew coming in, especially that late in the process, I believe it was in May, uh, last May, that, all right, I'm going to sit behind the older guys and just learn and, and grow uh, and improve and develop. And and he's done that. And so I think this corner room, and I didn't even mention Zion Tracy or Elliot Washington either, who played mm-hmm. uh, you know pretty decent roles as true yep. freshmen last year. Like this this corner room is, a, is in a really interesting spot. I mean, if I had to guess, um, you know, the two outside corners in terms of starters would probably be AJ Harris and, uh, and Cam Miller, but, yep. 
Uh, there's going to be a lot of, in terms of playing time at all these positions. But I think corner in particular, when you have uh, that deep of a room, Terry Smith said it's probably the deepest room he's had. Um, you know, it's nice to have the depth, but you need guys to step forward and really own those roles. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really intrigued in August to see how that all pans out. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the wideout room and James, James was, was singing that same old song at the, mm-hmm. at the last press conference uh, after the blue white game about the opportunity to make huge improvements, you know, outside of spring going into August because, because of the position and catching passes and building a rapport I kind of buy it, but I don't really buy it. I, I think, Johnny, that once you get past Fleming and Wallace, I, I just think that um, the uncertainty there is real. I, I don't know what the trust level is for Marcus Higgins and, uh, you know, uh, James Franklin as, as far as, you know, who, 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 is, who can they count on really, you know, after, after that. Same with, same with uh, the OC, Andy Kotelnicki. I think the second tight end – to me is a position that a lot of people should pay attention to because it relates to the wideout room. I, I, I do believe if they feel better about that second tight end, you're going to see a lot. You're just going to see a lot of two tight end sets. It just makes too much sense. And they have some between Dinkins and Rappelier. I mean, I really liked Rappelier. I liked the way he moved in the blue white game. He's certainly, he's certainly big enough to help as a blocker in the running game and contribute as a receiver. Whoever emerges as the number two tight end, and I, I know they'll probably play three, I think that's going to be a huge deal for Penn State. The other one I wanted to ask you about is right tackle, because as much as they like Anthony Donko, the second-year player, he was not available in the blue-white game. I heard he was dealing with an injury, and I don't know how significant it is, but you know, assuming that Shelton is the left tackle, and I think it's a logical assumption, the right tackle, that's, that's a big deal. Caden Wallace isn't around, and – you know, is, is, if Donko's healthy, that's great, Uh, but will he be pushed and how hard will he be pushed by somebody maybe like Nolan Rucci? I I don't, I think that's another position to me that it's, I'm not, I'm not really sure who, I can't say for sure who I know who's going to be the starter at right tackle and maybe Penn State doesn't know either. Yeah. I mean, Penn State had a phenomenal situation last year at tackle, uh, having Drew Shelton be the swing and having, Obviously, a top 11 pick in Olu Fashnu at left tackle. But then, you know, we saw what Caden was able to do at right tackle and have his best season in a Penn State uniform. Yeah. Uh, the New England Patriots valued him as the number 68 overall player uh, in the NFL draft. And uh, I think it just speaks to the kind of year uh, that Caden Wallace had and the, the experience and everything that goes along with that. And so, uh, as much as they will definitely miss Olu. Um, you know, they're going to be missing Caden as well. And like yeah. you mentioned, I, I think, I think Shelton is, is, is pretty much a lock at left tackle as long as he's healthy after missing spring camp. Um, but at right tackle, you know, Anthony Donko, Nolan Rucci coming in from, from Wisconsin, JB Nelson could pop out to tackle. Yeah. Uh, even Javen Williams could play mm-hmm. uh, the right side after he repped mostly on, on the left side during spring. And so if you're Phil Troutline, the offensive line coach, you know, you've got a lot of different moving parts right now. And especially with a J.B. Nelson inside at guard, uh, you know, you could flip him out to tackle and you have Ben Guy owned to, to plug in there at left guard if you want to. Um, and so, yeah, I think the right tackle spot is definitely one to watch. Um, and just another name to know uh, while we're talking about the yeah. offensive line and just to keep in mind as uh, as training camp approaches, because it, it'll it'll be here in a few months, Bob. Uh, is Cooper Cousins because yeah. you know, the true freshman uh, early enrollee was like the buzzy name to know coming out of spring camp, um, at least on the offensive side of the ball. And we talked about how, you know, it's, it's mostly it's, it's a rare situation for true freshman offensive linemen to come in and play prominent roles at the power five and the big 10 level specifically. Um, but he's a guy that they could use all across the offensive line if they need to, even if, even in a you know a, a backup you know position. Mm-hmm. So you figure Nick Dawkins is going to be the center, and you figure that you know Sal Wormley will be the right guard. Um, but man, if, if Cooper Cousins you know pushes them a bit, like I wouldn't be surprised if if he is uh, you know as the season progresses, you know earning a bit of a role even in a rotational way. But yeah, right tackle is is absolutely one to watch and and, and a and a position that you know, frankly, might not be solved, um, you know, completely by week one. You know, that, that could be a situation where yeah. you're still figuring it out, uh, you know, through September. 
Yeah, and you know, you know, I mean, you know as well better than anyone. You open on the road in Morgantown, it is gonna be beyond loud in that atmosphere. You know, it's it's gonna be tough to function as an offense. And if you're a new offensive lineman or a young offensive lineman, there could be some problems. There could be some penalties. Um, you know, I, a couple of years ago, they they really struggled uh, after Sean Clifford got hurt against Iowa in Iowa City. Uh, there was all kinds of problems with the offensive line and the new quarterback. And I'm just, they're not, they're, they are opening, you know, this is a lot like 2022 when they opened against a tough uh, opponent at Purdue. But that Purdue crowd is not the West Virginia crowd. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be nuts, but that that's their game of the season. Yeah. That yeah. is West Virginia's game, like oh, yeah. the home game of the season. Like that is the, the marquee game on the schedule for them, and it's week one. Yeah. Uh, and, and I wouldn't be surprised. I know it's scheduled right now for August 31st. Wouldn't be surprised if that's moved up a, a day or two, and that's a night game uh, and, and has a crazy, crazy crowd of a bunch of Mountaineers who've been tailgating all goddamn day and ready for that, uh, ready for that crowd and ready for that. What are you moment. trying to say, Johnny? What is spit? I'm, what I'm is saying West, I'm saying West Virginia fans know how to party okay. and, and they're going to be partying all day before that game. It's going to be loud. I'm not saying Penn state can't handle it or won't handle it, uh, but just something to, to keep in the back of your mind as we go through uh, you yeah. know, this, uh, this summer and into training camp and look at the offensive line and what kind of, what combination would work best for that environment. Johnny, I wouldn't mind at all if they wanted to give me a Saturday off on the first college football. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, I would, I would, I'd be heartfeltly, I'd be very grateful if they wanted to move that game. They could play it on Tuesday. I don't care yeah. if they want to give me a Saturday. I'll take it in September or August. August, excuse me. I would, I would gladly take it because that's Labor Day weekend after that, Bob. Yeah. So, yeah. Little extended weekend. I know. You know, we would have the press conference on Monday. I think still. Yeah. Uh, but I would certainly take it. When are you breaking out the icy light mango? When does it officially mango season? Oh, he's got it. Uh, you really need – oh, you see, Penn State fans, you really need to watch the video and not listen to the podcast. You get it's, the unopened. it's unopened. It's unopened. I don't, I'm don't. i not buying that. It's open. I'm not drinking um, while we're recording, Bob, but – yeah. Uh, no, I just, uh, I yeah. just, it was, it was handy. Um, Johnny's got his Liverpool hat on. He's got icy light mango, like two feet from his, where he's doing this podcast. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be a good weekend. I think for Johnny McGonagall, I hope it is Johnny, before we go, uh, do you want to, you mentioned, uh, all the avian Collins story that you're working on. I also know that you have a Drew Aller story I do, that you're yeah. going to work on. You want to just kind of, uh, maybe set, tee that up for the fans, what, what they can expect. Yeah, definitely. This was a, a you know a few weeks ago. Um, I guess it was the week, uh, a, a, you know, a few days before the blue-white game. Uh, I, I mentioned it before. I was able to sit down um, uh, and do do some one-on-one -on -one interviews um, <clears throat> in the Morgan Academic Center, which is adjacent to the Lash Building. Uh, talked to Julian Fleming uh, for a half hour. Really great conversation. That story uh, has been out for a couple weeks now uh, about his you know transfer and everything that went into his decision to come to Penn State. Had a really good conversation with a new offensive coordinator, Andy Kotelnicki. Mm -hmm. uh, that story will be dropping, uh, I believe, in the next couple weeks. Uh, but had a really good, you know, talk with Drew, and uh, you know, we we discussed everything from you know taking over for Sean Clifford, the the on the off the field, um, you know, trials, tribulations, ups, downs of being the first year starting quarterback at Penn State last year, and what he hopes and expects to get out of this upcoming season, how he hopes to improve, and uh, and yeah, it was just and just getting into the mind of QB one a little bit, and uh, and just seeing how he processes everything and, and how he looks back on you know a, a ten and two season that you know they didn't beat Ohio State uh, in his homecoming uh, to Columbus, they didn't beat Michigan, uh, and, and just trying to trying to see where he's at uh, really from a headspace standpoint. Yeah, um, I think it was a really good conversation. He's really he was honest and, and great with his time. Uh, so, yeah, that story is going to be coming out on Thursday morning on Penn Live. So, uh, listeners, uh, subscribers, be sure to check that out. Well done, Johnny. Enjoy uh, the rest of your week. I'll be in touch, but uh, we'll be back next week to talk some Penn State football, maybe maybe Johnny's Memorial Day plans. I don't know, but you just never – Johnny, I'm just going to keep you guessing for the next couple of podcasts. Hopefully, you're going to be on your toes. But thanks for listening. Thanks for watching.